Thanks a lot. Thanks. No, he, what he didn't say is that during that weekend, it was very interesting because there were a bunch of uh, German writers, and I discovered something called metaphysical angst, something you don't have here at DLD, or a chain smoking at the time. It was different. Anyway, so I got this email, you know, forcing me to come back. I was here five years ago, and I thought I was out of that business, but I can't say no to Steffi, you know, and, and Johan. So, thanks a lot. I'm going to be talking about systems, how they handle disorder, and how we can um, taxonomize system based on that criterion. What you see up there is a coffee cup, no? What's the main characteristic of a coffee cup? It's fragile. Now, why is it fragile? It took me 21 years to figure it out. It's fragile because it doesn't like volatility. If there's an earthquake in uh, Munich, I'm not predicting, you know, okay, the, a coffee cup will ha has no upside from it, no? So I was a trader specializing in volatility and how things respond to volatility. It took me 21 years to realize it could be generalized to other things and started with a coffee cup. A coffee cup doesn't like volatility. And if we take the idea to its natural conclusion, it is fragile because it doesn't like volatility. Okay, let's continue now. Odds are you won't see the connection with the next slide, but in your opinion, which uh, of the two pictures is more attractive, aesthetically attractive to you? The one on the left, the one on the right? Sorry? The one on the right, unless you have some uh, metaphysical angst or you've been... Uh, doing a lot of substances. Okay, so why is it, and, and we're going to see what's the connection with the coffee cup, but why is it that the one on the right, the, the, the natural thing, is more attractive than the other one? Has anyone ever seen an ugly natural scene? No, okay. Visibly, well, visibly, you know, it's not unlimited, but we, ha we like some class of disorder. Okay, now let's try to connect this with a coffee cup. I think I have an extra 15 minutes and let's see if I manage to connect it to the coffee cup. One observation, we live today in a very smooth environment. This is from the Vatican Museum. You can hardly find any surface from a classical age that's smooth. Everything has to have some kind of ornament. Why? We don't like smooth surfaces. We like a little bit of dimensionality, a little bit of disorder in what we observe. I'll connect it to the coffee cup to things that like disorder. But there you go. Now, this is the only slide with words, what I call the disorder brother. Object that like one of them, like all of them. Time and disorder are the same thing. You see, for a physicist. Chaos, unpredictability, and we've got to try to link them, and there's a way to detect sensitivity to disorder by objects. For that, well, I started with a coffee cup. The coffee cup is fragile for reasons that are obvious. The opposite would be something that would not be robust, would be something that thrives, likes disorder, and you had to create a category of objects that are easy to define mathematically, but although a little bit harder verbally, think that like disorder. The opposite of fragile is not robust. It's something that wants mishandling, okay? Well, it turns out a lot of things like disorder around us, but we sort of don't like them simply because just, uh, it's the same thing as with sugar. You see, whenever I see a cake, and it's very tempting to be here, uh, particularly for someone who doesn't eat sugar or claims not to eat sugar. I probably had my 5,000 calories this morning, all right? You can't see any sweet thing without, you know, uh, uh, you can't resist it because we're programmed, you know, for an environment that did not have a lot of sugar. It's the same thing with disorder. Because risk, you know, can kill you, we developed a, a dislike of variability. 
but we lived in an environment we could control. So we had thermal variability, we had a lot of variability we could control. Today, we can control variability, hence we are harming ourselves, eliminating some classes of disorder. And effectively, we don't talk about these things. How many of you have heard of something called post-traumatic stress, uh, post-traumatic disorder? All right, all of you. How about the vastly more frequent post-traumatic growth? Okay, not that many. Why? What's the reason? What do you think is the reason? Because nobody can make any money try to cure you of post-traumatic growth. Okay. So we have a lot of classes of objects that actually need, you know, when you, you go to the gym, why? You overcompensate, your body overcompensates, you need some kind of random events, okay? Because that's how you communicate with nature, and you overcompensate, and that's how you grow. So if you make the environment very comfortable, you harm yourself, just like you harm yourself aesthetically by having smooth surfaces. Now, if I'm gonna die, if I die, ever die, just the only thing to retain is this graph, because this allows us to spot if something likes disorder or doesn't like disorder, okay? And it's that accelerating curve. And, and let me explain it. And, and we'll, we'll explain it, uh, uh, you know, I'll have a few minutes, and, and you're gonna get the point. Don't be too overawed by the, 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 the graph. If I jump 10 meters, Okay, I, you know, uh, I don't know about Munich, but in, in other places, people die, no? Okay, but if I jump five meters, I may survive, no? So 10 meters harm me more than twice five meters, you agree? Okay, look at the curve now. So therefore, if I jump 10 meters, I'm harmed more than 10 times if I jump one meter, more than a thousand times if I jump one centimeter, and this is the property of every object that is around. Why? Because if you are linear to harm, you die walking to the office. You have to have accelerated harm. Anything that has survived has to have this accelerating sensitivity to harm. If, if I hit you on the head, I mean, no, it's just a thought experiment, it's not a threat. With 100 kilos, I'll harm you a lot more than if I hit you 100 times with one kilo, you agree? So it means every additional kilo harms you more than the previous one. Well, this, here we have three things going on, a definition of fragility, a way to identify fragility, and explanation of how the world works. Everything nonlinear has to have the sensitivity and if you have this accelerated harm, you are fragile. So the, the, it means you have a negative second order effect. And, and let me explain it here. Say you have a grandmother and you have the information that she spent the last two days at 70 degrees US, uh, you know, uh, not 70 degrees German, not Fahrenheit, uh, Fahrenheit, not uh, Celsius, okay? You would think that's perfect. Now you have another piece of information that she spent the first day at zero degrees and the second one at 140 degrees for an average of 70 degrees. Well, visibly, you have no grandmother and inheritance and a lot of social duties for the funerals and stuff like that. Okay, all right. What is it about fragility that has to reside in second order effects? Okay, fragility is second order effects. If you are fragile, you don't want variability like the grandmother, except that we may want some variability around, you know, 20 degrees Celsius plus or minus five degrees, so the curve isn't as simplified. Well, with this, we can pretty much identify what's fragile, what's not fragile. Is fragile what has locally, all right, a concave, the one on the right, response? Curves like this, just like the first graph. Is Anti-fragile, what is convex, and we're going to explain it. And, and if, of course, if I die and you retain this, my job is done. Okay? The way to identify it is as follows. That make you remember what's fragile and what's not fragile, right? And the best way to view it is as follows with this graph. If 
you know, you're a company, you're anything, a, an event gives you more upside than downside, if you have accelerated, you know, an accelerating um, curve for gains, you are anti-fragile. If you have accelerating harm, you are fragile. What is fragile will eventually break. The interesting thing about fragility is unlike, you know, the black swan bothers me a lot because it's a sexy image. Journalists love sexy images. It is lurid. This is vastly more useful, but you cannot predict black swans. What we can do here is measure sensitivity to random events. And you can get it from detecting the acceleration. How fast, you know, harm increases. You know, in other words, I just bang you with a stone of one kilo and then two kilos, and I see an increase in harm. How nonlinear, and I can predict where you're gonna die. You see? You can measure a lot of things that way. We can measure, for example, the smallest beautiful, you know? The Tower of Babel, the, 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 the Babylonians figured it out, that a tall tower is vastly more fragile than a lot of small houses because you have a concave response. This explains why we have much fewer elephants than rats. As an animal gets larger, it's vastly more efficient, like a large company, but vastly more fragile to random events, accelerating harm. Remember, falling from 10 meters is vastly more harmful than 10 times one meter. With this, we can do a lot of things. Uh, there's some, now, there's something called Jensen's inequality, for any of you who has, have, you know, if you've done some math. If you haven't done math, I'm gonna explain it. Unfortunately, the, the, this image didn't transfer very well, but that's okay. Anything in nature, is nonlinear. It has sort of an S-curve, some kind of S-curve, okay? It can be a regular S-curve, it can be S-curve that uh, is nonlinear. In other words, the thing goes up here, like if someone tells me uh, a weekend in Philadelphia is better than nothing, so you have uh, gains, but two weekends in Philadelphia is worse than nothing, all right? You know, sort of like having a guest over for a weekend is great, having a guest over for five years isn't that great, all right? So it's the same thing with any substance. A glass of wine is good, uh, 500 isn't that good, okay? So you have that curve, that S-curve, but it can go back down. Now the part that is convex is very interesting. You need randomness, you need variation. And the part that is concave, you want steadiness. And let me explain it. Let me go back to the previous graph. Medicine, you know, figure out a few things, but anecdotally, without mathematizing it. But when you mathematize it, and, and, and an option trader can see that, I mean, you don't have to be a mathematician, you realize that it's better to have this plus this than that, when the curve is, when you have a convex curve. And let me explain it. If you put someone on a lung ventilator, because they have weak, weak lungs, okay, in hospitals, and you give them the dose, 100% of the dose, the person dies. If you randomize 50% to 150%, guess what? The person survives. You're better off having 50% and then 150% than 100% of the dose twice. What well, turns out that anything, any part of your life that is in a convex phase requires variability. And anything in a concave phase wants steadiness. And this is very general. When you look at the S-curve, very general, okay? You take feeding, for example. Now we're discovering the value of fasting. Much better to have meat, a lot of meat, you know, a whole lamb, you know, at a festival, and then spend 40 days with no animal products than have your steak and eggs every morning for 40 days, you see, for 41 days. So whatever phase is, Convex in response, and everything in nature is nonlinear, convex and concave, requires some volatility. Now, option traders understand it easily because we work with volatility. We work with how things are volatile, how things respond to volatility. Not option traders, they, they don't have the terminology. They have, they understand the phenomena, they don't have the terminology. But, but you can apply it very easily. Say your workout, what's better for you? 
if you have that convex phase, what's better? To lift one kilo a thousand times or to lift a hundred kilos ten times? You see? Well, if you are in a convex phase, it's much better to do nothing than lift ten times rather than lift all the time. You can also figure out why it's better to walk and sprint than jog. You see? In that convex phase, it's better to eat. You know, you've heard of these diets where you eat a lot one day and, and nothing the other day or much less the other day. Same thing. Okay, eliminates diabetes, for example. So, but this initially, this idea came to me from the detection of fragility, that anything fragile doesn't like second order effects. And anything non-fragile loves second order effects. So I think I'm done with this. I'm, I'm sure you're a little bit confused, which is okay. I have 600 pages of explanation in my book. I think 0% of journalists understood the point, 100% uh, of firefighters, uh, and, and the rest of the people, I think 90% of regular citizens, and 0% of economics professors, all right? They can't get through it, okay? And so you can find the ideas in a book. Meanwhile, I guess we can take a couple of questions, no? All right, so let's go. But don't ask me anything about Bitcoin, I have no clue. In, in one of your earlier lines, you used the phrase of uh, imperfect knowledge, economics. Yes. This is uh, exactly um, an effort, actually, at NYU by Roman Friedman to cover exactly the phenomena you have described here. Sorry, can I get back the slides, please? Yeah. So at least uh, there are some people who are dealing with this, also in the INET Center for the Imperfect Knowledge Economics in Copenhagen. Okay, so he, the gentleman is saying that some people are dealing with imperfect knowledge in economics, uh, just like uh, some people are singing opera, like I'm presenting an opera, and someone, oh, it's not new because some, somebody sang another opera, uh, you know, the other day, the other place. So this is definitely not covered by economists. They're starting to be aware of imperfect knowledge, but what I've met here is the last slide I'm going to show you, which is... The inter no, no, I missed the slide. Okay, I, I don't have the slide here. But the idea is you generate a process, okay, in which someone is tinkering. You don't know what's going on. How do you probe, you know, randomness? You, by tinkering. You don't know what's going on. You go one step at a time and you tinker. It's like an option, okay? You're not locked into a long-term uh, plan. You tinker. You have optionality. Trial and error to get the same effect with knowledge, you need 1,000 IQ points. <laughs> Trial and error is the intelligence of you know, doing things. Remember, trial and error responds to variability because if you're not harmed by the mistake and you gain from them, you have more gains than losses from them, then you do very well from trial and error. This is how you probe. You know, my, I'm not talking about unknown. I'm talking about how to deal with the unknown through systems that gain for variability. And effectively, nature deals with variability up to a point. Nature loves randomness because you cannot have selection if you don't have instability in the environment. So effectively, it's a different approach from the one economists are using about the unknown. Uh, another I question? I have one, more, one small question about technology. You, uh, you wrote that the financial system being big, interconnected, global, exposes us, increases the level of fragility. So these big, big interconnected things like cloud computing, the Internet of Things, are they adding to the fragility of our system? Are we working in favor of fragility? Will anyone take okay. control of my refrigerator? This is, this is a graph of what happens. The fragile system is that big tall tower rather than small things. This is why if you decentralize mistakes, you have a system that makes a lot of decisions, it's vastly more robust than, than making a few decisions, and you cannot compensate it with economies of scale. Economies of scale seem to not exist in reality. The or good thing that you teach in MBA school, but doesn't exist in, you know, we don't see it. It's not in the numbers. It's everywhere not in the numbers. So a system that's centralized, obviously will fail at some point. It's an S-curve, become a lot of will fail. The point is when and how. If governments prop it up, you have a problem. 
if you let them fail the way Alta Vista failed, and you remember how, how long it took to go from Alta Vista to Google? Hours, no? OK, so when Google fails, you just have to make sure that nobody props it up so we have a smooth transition to Schmoogle or uh, something else very quickly. This is the point. So a healthy system is a system in which failures okay, don't endanger the system. They stay local like in a restaurant business. So if, if the systemic coming from failure of one unit and the government would need to step in, it's not a good system. All right, we're done. Thanks. All right, bye.